All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Football Focus Weekly, the radio show with CFI, Charlotte Football Insiders, here on WDRB Media. Our show is brought to you by MEP Collective. For all your food consulting leads, make sure you visit uh, mepcollective.com. Once again, mepcollective.com for all your food consulting needs. Also, the CFI Spring Showcase is happening Saturday, May 18th over at West Mecklenburg High School. This is the last week for early bird pricing of $79. Make sure you go to charlottefootballinsiders.com and register for that showcase. We have had colleges confirming their appearance. And um, over the next, maybe in about two weeks, we'll release the colleges that have committed to attend. And then as we get more colleges that commit to attend, uh, we'll share those out with you as well. All right, tonight's show is going to be a fun one to talk about. Uh, to start off, we're going to talk about 7-on-7 seven seven football versus track. What is the best way for skilled players in the offseason to get ready uh, for an upcoming football season? Then we'll talk about coaches recruiting other teams' players. Is it happening? If it does happen, why does it happen? Um, and we'll get into the nuts and bolts about that. Uh, Then we'll have my top class of 2025 linebacker rankings in the Charlotte metro area. I'll give you my top five, and then I'll give you a couple others to watch. And then we'll finish up the show. Uh, Unfortunately, we've talked about this many times throughout the last six years. Garinger High School, their head coaching position is open once again, and uh, we'll we'll talk through that. Uh, Tonight, I've got with me to start out the show. We call him Adam Big Eye Shelby Weber. What's going on, Phil? What's going on? Happy to be in the number one more time, man. <laughs> <laughs> Happy I know where I, I know where that comes from. That's that's all right. That's all right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So uh to start off the show, like I said, we're gonna talk about seven on seven versus track in the offseason for skilled players. Um, I, I see Coach Hunt is here um, joining us. He says wrestling <laughs> instead of either one of those. So uh, I, that's that's a good point. The big boy's got to do something. Uh, before we get started, let's bring on. I didn't think we were going to have him, but he's here. Coach Dub. What's going on? What's Man, going I, on I, I saw you posting pictures on a beach. <laughs> yeah. I thought yeah. you were um, gonna have something, something in your hand, and uh, just be chilling. No, nah, no, nah, uh, after the show festivities. After the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, Coach Moore joining us. Good to see you, man. As always. All right. Well, let's talk about it. Seven on seven versus track. Uh, well, Coach Dell, we'll let you go first on this, man. What do you recommend for your um, for you guys in the off season? Definitely track. Um, if there are skill guys or speed guys, you definitely should be doing something with track. Um, it's nothing gonna hurt you with football. Football speed's part of football, the football game. So definitely doing track is is major for me. Um, the seven on seven work, I don't want to knock it because people knock it so much. It's really like your preference, but too much football it can hurt you at times too because. For 707, sometimes it teaches bad habits and, and, and things that depend on your position, but sometimes it can just teach bad habits, but you can never have a bad habit of being too fast. So I always I always say focus on track and lock in there. All right. All right. Good stuff. Also, you're a state championship track coach, so. Three I'll, times. I'll, Three times. Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I expected you to say that. I, uh, but I'm interested to see what you got, big guy. What, what do you think? Uh, I agree for sure. If you're a skill player, a skill guy, you should definitely be running track. Um, I don't see why you wouldn't want to run track. Uh, when I was coming up, talking with high school players, it was mandatory for you to run track or participate in some event. Um, I think what it is for a lot of people, I think a lot of people that try to go do seven on seven, you want to do it as a replacement four track but i think that you can do both because a lot of the kids i know that play seven on seven you're not practicing every day like track like you may practice 
maybe one, maybe once or maybe twice a week. And it's normally later in the afternoon after track practice. So I think you still able to do both, but if you definitely a skilled guy, why wouldn't you run track? Take the instance with um with Dudley. Like you see the speed of Dudley, that's not just because those guys just play football, it's because they do football in track. Um, and there's plenty of programs like that that have guys that speedsters on the football field because of the track workout and regimen that they do um, outside of football. So I think a lot of sports can be skill specific. Like if you're a lineman and you're not doing track, um, you should wrestle. You should wrestle during basketball season if you're not playing basketball. Uh, some of the linemen that if you have a lineman that has problems with weight problems, the best thing for him to do is wrestling because you're going to – for sure, even if you don't compete in the meet, in the competitions, you're going to lose weight by participating in wrestling practice. So I think like it's like what Coach Dub say, um, it's all position position specific for me. And but I do think I think you can do both. I just think it has to be a good balance. Like you, we shouldn't be going to seven on seven practice, and then when we do football practice, it's like you out of breath or you're tired because what are you doing in, with your practices? Whether whether that may be track or uh, seven on seven football. Yeah, those are some good points. Um, got a couple more in the comments. Uh, Coach Vereen, defense coordinator at North Mech, says he prefers track. Yeah. Um, and then we got a parent here. Uh, Miss Aaron says her son does both, but he's getting more out of track right now. So that's it. Because to be honest, 707 right now, Coach Rob can attest to this. 707 is for offense. So it's not It's not like you playing defense. Like, I'll tell you for instance, right, the, um, the two twins at Weddington, they playing linebacker on seven on seven teams right now. Now for them, it's showing how versatile and how skilled they are. But that's something that's gonna help them. But that's not gonna benefit every lineman saying, "Oh, you should go play seven on seven. Like you're gonna get more out of track because only thing you're gonna do with track is run. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna run nonstop. So if you need to get faster, you run track by running against or with faster people. If you're a person that needs to learn how to maintain speed, you run track. Now that teaches you how to maintain speed, whether it's the 200 or the 400 or four by fours or 800s, whatever, you learn how to maintain speed. Because some people, you may not be a speedster. You may be a guy that you may be a home run hitter with having some speed in the open field. Okay, cool. If you never work on that outside of – in basketball, you don't work on home runs, like home run speed, because the basketball court yeah. is not as long as the football field. So – with back, so with football, if I got a running back that's a home run hitter, the only way you can maintain top speed and, and continue your speed is if you do run track. Because mm -hmm. if we could be honest, even when you go to college and you come home, you know your kids, they're not running sprints all the time. They may run 30-yard sprints, 40-yard sprints. A lot of them, they're running 110-yard sprints because that, that covers everything that you're going to work on the football. Yeah. You're working on speed, maintaining speed, top speed, and endurance, all in one, all in one sprint. And I think too with seven of sevens, it could create a, a bad habits outside of your actual home team. Because the thing is, the receivers that you're playing with, if you're a quarterback, those are the, not the receivers that you're playing with at your home school. So seven on seven should be about developing chemistry with the the kids that you're gonna be playing with in the fall. So if you're on a seven on seven on seven team now, how much can that actually help you? Versus what we do in June and July. Um, Adam will tell you, we're going to get enough seven on sevens in high school in June and July. These off seasons right now should be about lifting weights, getting stronger, and getting faster. And that's what track brings to the table. Also, with your linemen, I got linemen as throwers. So what we do with our linemen as throwers, we work on a block starts. We work on a starts. How does that help linemen? It helps with their initial explosion. Mm -hmm. So you start getting some of those guys quicker and more faster you start being more explosive you start getting stronger and using muscles because in track yeah football got running in it but track you're going to use all your muscles you don't use muscles that you didn't even know exist like when i got athletes that that do football versus track those football um, athletes will tell you when we do track they're like dang coach i'm hurting i'm hurting it all over so track is going to give you a complete body workout um, and so by the time you get back to your school team, which we usually start spring and summer ball in June, you have worked on the conditioning. How much football do you need to see right now? You get what I'm saying? So for me, I don't like my, my guys to see a football until like 
the middle part of June because we'll get to the football stuff. But it's the conditioning piece. It's the explosion piece. It's so much stuff the track brings to the table. And then yeah. as well, like this is well, it's like what uh, Coach Rob said about the seven on seven. It provides a false hope because from a defensive side, seven on seven, all these coaches are doing is playing man to man. Now, what team you know just plays man one hundred and forty plays in a game? All right. So and also, we look as I look at seven seven as this. Like, if you're going to play as play seven on seven and compete, like, what are you learning that? What are you learning that you need to work? Like, are you playing seven on seven to work on certain things? Okay, Coach Rob can have a quarterback and say, "Look, I want you to play seven on seven because I need you to learn how to read multiple defenses and play with new people." Okay, cool. Because a quarterback, you got to be able to manage multiple personalities on your team because most quarterbacks are looked at as the leader, right? If I have a linebacker and I go to seven on seven practice and he's playing heels at seven. It's no time in our defense where you're gonna play when you with your heels at seven yards playing linebacker. So it's a lot mm-hmm. of false hope. And then when you dropping, they're just dropping straight back. They're not dropping, opening up to the strong side mm-hmm. or looking for people coming across with digs or drags. Like they're not looking for that in 707. Because everybody's playing man to man. So it's like if you're the backer that don't have nobody, oh, you just drop to a spot and just and just try to see see who can get the best pitchers or who can get the best pick from helping somebody. So a lot of people they're not getting. Now, a lot of 707 programs do teach and train those guys in areas that they need to be worked on. So this is not for every 707 program or organization, but a lot of programs or organizations, like Coach Vereen said in the comments, is it is made for recruiting. It is made for – Yeah, you know, I was holding off on that. It's made for bad habits because, like uh, – because, like, even some teams like – teams like Wellington, Mallory Creek, I know something that we're going to do. We're going to make a 707 team for the high school. And and, yeah. and 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 we can just go play. Now that's different mm-hmm. because now we're working on our stuff and you building a camaraderie with your guys during the summer and it gives you more stuff to do. But like Coach Dub right. said, you have to question it and be careful because too much football, because now if we like we drilling all this stuff into you now, when June hit, July hit, in them summer days where they start getting long, they're gonna be like them dog days. But that they're gonna be like, they're like, dang, I'm getting bored because we've yeah. been we've been doing it, you know what I'm saying? So it's like you gotta keep you gotta like hungry dogs run fast. So we got you got to you got to give them bits and pieces as you go on, but you want to make sure if you're doing seven on seven that it's very you got to make sure it's beneficial to what you're doing. Because I tell my kids all the time, if you're going to seven on seven and you're not learning nothing or you're not getting better, you're wasting time because you could be doing something else and wasting yeah. money on top of that. Seven yeah, you're wasting expensive. a lot of money. It's well, really Pat, that's yeah. that's that's the problem. Like a lot of people talk about these seven on sevens and how much money you pay. That's what people aren't aren't talking about. And the recruiting tool that a lot of these these area coaches are using. And for I'm gonna I'm gonna say what it is, uh, but also we it's catering to the parents' anxieties and the players' anxieties that more is better. More is not always better. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes right. just be simple. They they want all the football 24 seven. That's why a lot of these kids by the time and you and you know this Adam, you get to the third, fourth, fifth seat game of the season they burnt out they've been playing football all this time and it's like even having kids where you try to play zone and you try to play certain coverages and they can't play it play it because they think oh i thought we was a man-to-man how many blown assignments have you seen and you have to go back and reteach it because again a lot of those seven or seven um seven or seven creates bad habits i'll give you another example the quarterback position how many times, and it irks me, and I hate watching this 707 video, where 707 when quarterbacks are throwing it and they keep their feet still, mm-hmm. right? I, I, and, and they throw them with their feet still. That is a bad habit. You got a whole offensive line and defensive line trying to come after you. You got to keep active feet. And that's where you see a lot of quarterbacks, oh, man, my old line is terrible. No, you're used to playing in 707 where you got that, you could throw the throw go to the time and routes, whatever the question may be, but it creates bad habits. And um, I would say track a hundred percent. You know, if you want to do both again, do it, but I think it's too much football. Yeah. To your point about quarterbacks, I talked to two really reputable coaches that they're not in the area anymore, but they, they were in the area. And they both told me that the one thing they really hate about seven on seven is other people coaching their quarterbacks do things that they wouldn't coach them to do. And one of the points that you said about footwork, when you look at a 707 highlight video, I'll see a quarterback, they'll take the ball off a little tee, and they'll just stand there. And they're just reading the defense, and then they just 
Don't look like a little fade route, like you're talking about the timing route. And there's no drop, there's no rhythm. <laughs> the, the routes don't marry, you know, the concepts the right way. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. There's a lot. Uh, producer, welcome to the show. Brandon Black. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. You want to add anything on this topic? Um, seven on seven versus track. I mean, I think I agree with uh, kind of echo up what Coach Dub was saying that you don't want to get you know over you don't want to uh, you know fry your brain on football. Definitely, I think it's definitely sense of a quarterback because how you make reads and things like that, and then you your coach is telling you one thing, your seven on seven coach is telling you the other. I think track is universal. There's no you know speed is speed, agility, all of that. That's that can apply anywhere. So you know, I guess you know track to me might be the better decision for some people um, because it's gonna apply to any position. Any position can be faster. So I think. You know, yeah. I, would, I would lean towards that. And then some guys just do too much with football. When they go into camps, they're playing seven on seven, and they just burnt out. They're not – they're running at 75 80% and not putting their best foot forward. So there is a thing is it burnt out. And I think young guys think they're invincible. I'm 16, 17. I can do this all day. I can run all day. You're still human. So you don't want to get burnt out, and you run the risk of that. So to finish up the segment, uh, Coach Vereen from North Mech once again says track helps your 40 time at these camps, helps acceleration and deceleration and quick twitch muscle. Correct. Universal. Then, Universal skills. <laughs> and then kind of a segue into our next segment, seven on seven teams are recruiting trap for thirsty coaches. Woo. Hmm. Mm. I love I love some uh, wow. off the record uh, elaboration on that one. <laughs> <laughs> we won't touch that right now on the air. Oh, but... well, we we getting ready to touch it. We getting ready to touch it because in the next segment, we're going to talk about coaches recruiting other teams' players. Does it happen? And if it does, how does it happen? Coach Dub, you done bought a new property, man. Man, you know the state, baby, parts of the known. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> we'll be right back here on WDRB. <laughs> and about got the new crib, okay? <laughs> oh goodness. Okay, we're back now. Let's talk about this next subject. And when we got on Facebook, um, I want to pull up some of these comments that I got from area coaches because this this really kind of got some conversation going. So, coaches recruiting other teams' kids. Let's just flat out. Put it out there, guys. Does this happen? Uh, yes, it happens. It happens every day. I'm not even a coach, and I can say yes. It happens every day. Um, right. I would say yeah, I would yeah. look at it. I would say I would look at it like this. Um, I think with recruiting other kids' players, obviously, I don't think I don't think a lot of coaches should do it. But at the same time, I look at it like two ways, right? We have to understand when it comes to recruiting that you got to involve the parents, right? So I believe that I think a lot of kids just recruit themselves to other programs because they have something they are, they are attracted to. Um, like take for instance, right? Uh, when Chambers, when Mallow Creek went on their run first, was that 13, 14, 15? A lot, they were doing a lot of things that attracted kids to their program. Uh, you have it where with Chambers, when they went on their run, they're doing a lot of things. They became the most popular team in North Carolina because of the antics or because of the winning and because of all those things, right? So a lot of things that people are doing recruitment-wise, they're just winning, right, in a sense. But I, but it, it is a lot of coaches that really DM players say, hey, your school sucks, come here, right? But I think, I think the lost part of the recruiting thing as a whole is about – as a current coach at your school and you losing kids, what are, you have to understand that you lose, you may be losing kids for a reason, right? Because even with coaches, right? I'm sure people have called coach Rob and say, Hey, coach Rob, you should come to my school. But at the same time, it's something about where he's at right now that doesn't want him to leave. Right. It's something that's keeping him there to not want you to leave. And I think a lot of times with recruit, I think a lot, a lot of coaches get bent out of shape about recruiting or certain things that happen, they can't, they know they're messing up in certain areas and they can't, and they're not able to keep the current kids that they got or have a fear of the kids leaving, I would think. Yeah. 
And Pep, it's, it's just like dating. It's, it's all like dating. It's like a marriage. It was like dating. Like men, it's like Pep. I'm sure men, men see your wife. They going They may say something to her. They see Coach Rod. They may say something to her. But it's something. But, it, but I'm saying. But it's something that they're. Where doing. is this going? Hold on. <laughs> listen, That's a listen, heck of an analogy, just, man. Listen, it's just like listen. It, it, it it's just like recruiting, right? You yeah. are, you guys have beautiful wives. Other men will see your wife and may try to hit on them or talk to them. But it's the reason that they say no, and that's something that you two are doing at home to provide a security and a love and trust and respect thing. Women that that's easy to go, they they lacking something. Yeah. It's something that they want to go get or they do something different. So with recruiting, I look at it like dating. I can't take a woman that don't want to be took. I see yeah. where he went with that. To be you honest. know what I'm saying? So yeah. with the kid, so with the kid is like, I can't take your kid. If your kid don't want to leave, like Coach Robert have coached a, a lot of amazing players. People probably have called and said, hey, come here. They like, nah, because it's a reason why they want to stay and play for them. You know what I'm saying? I just think when we're, when people – I think a lot of recruiting, it becomes easier because the kids or parents don't want to be there no more, and they just didn't know that somebody valued their kid in a different way than their current place do or just somewhere else. Yeah. And see, because we stay, we live in this front-running society. I call it a front-running society, where I think it started with LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, when they all came together versus, like, competing. I think the kids grew up on seeing that, that, hey, let's go and team up versus uh, let's compete against each other. I know when we came up, my best friends, I want, I want to take their head off. I want to play against them, then we hang out after these kids want to come together. They want to do a lot of front running. They see the videos. They want to do all the talking and stuff. So a lot of this time stuff is about front running. And also with football, you're always going to have disgruntled parents. That's just what it is. If any coach tell you, hey, I don't have disgruntled parents, they're lying. You're going to have parents that feel like you should be doing this better or that better. That's just part of serving people. You're going to have those things in serving people. So I see it on both sides. And then on the flip side, like Adam was saying, it's some coaches that lose kids because stuff that they're doing. Um, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm a great example. Everybody used to, in this area used to say, oh, y'all recruit. And I'm like, no, we don't. Recruit. We have a lot of it. We really can't recruit. If I could recruit, we would have been ran off four or five state championships. And anybody that knows, knows, knows that's a fact. So back then when we was going through all the recruiting stuff, it was like, dang, it's it's not that the kids coming to us because or trying to get to us because we're just these phenomenal coaches. It's stuff that you're doing wrong at your home school. I want your kids to stay at your school. It's very uncomfortable when you got kids that's reaching out to you or reaching out to people on your staff and you got to really be rude to them. Like, Hey, I can't talk to you. And that tears down relationships in the community. So I, I've seen it on both sides y'all, but also with coaches, before you accuse another coach of recruiting, make sure you have hard evidence. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you got hard evidence because people are throwing around, oh, this coach is recruiting. Well, show evidence where this coach is recruiting. And I'm telling you, I got a bunch of evidence on coaches where they directly inbox my guys. And, and my guys will say, look, look at coach. He sent me this. I'm like, oh, oh well, I know you're not going nowhere because you know, you know what's best for you. I mean, as far as the seeds that we plant and the growth that you have. So like like um, Adam said, if they want to go, I always say, if you want to go, go. Because if you stay and someone's recruiting you, then I got to manage and maintain that ego, not just the kid's ego, but the parent's ego. So my thing is, if you think the grass is green on the other side, like I would tell my wife, like Adam, you use it, the best analogy. I've had girlfriends in the past where it's like, okay, you think that's a better situation? Go ahead and go. But nine times out of ten, they'll be calling you back saying I messed up. So it, you got it, it's it's a thin line there. And I just warn all my co my um, high school coaches just be careful about um, saying someone's recruiting because these are these are these coaches' reputations, and everyone knows. And coaching your reputation is everything. So to throw out that someone's recruiting without hard evidence, that's that's a lot. That's a lot. So. Um, I would tell all the coaches just be mindful of that. You know, I'm a, I'm gonna tell you this, man. We established at the beginning of the segment that this is happening. When I said we were gonna talk about this, 
I got texts from coaches that were saying that they had evidence. And I've heard this before throughout the years. Coaches have evidence of these guys doing this stuff. So the question is, why do coaches not turn over the evidence they have on other coaches? I think so, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brotherhood thing. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Like, I, I, had, I had some stuff. And you know, Pep, it was a school accusers of calling the state on them. And I'm like, dude, I wouldn't do that. Like, we wouldn't do that. And I guess they wanted to believe it because they wanted to have something against us to begin with. And they still lost. It didn't work. But anywho, uh, the thing is, make sure you have that evidence. But you look at, like, me personally, I would go directly to that coach. Like, coach, hey, I got this information. What's going on? And some coaches I don't have a relationship with. I'm like, oh, well, if what he's putting in that text message or what she's putting in that text message is going to get you to transfer and uproot your family and leave a, a school more power to you. Hope, hopefully it works out. And I'm telling you, Pep, nine times out of 10, the transfers do not work out unless you're going to a powerhouse. And that works against you too, because how many kids did we see uh, go to certain school A, school B? And it's been a trend throughout the years where kids want to go to those schools. I won't name the schools we know. It, it doesn't work out for them. They first say, man, I want to go true. somewhere I can win. True. I, I want to go somewhere I can win. Okay. Winning and sitting on a bench is two different things, baby. And you can sit on a bench because I'm going to tell you what's awkward as a parent. I've, I've been a parent. Being in the stands. Now, I've never had experience, but I experienced this, but I heard horror stories. Your team is winning, but your son ain't getting playing time. So you're sitting in the stands like, Man, do I be happy? Am I disgruntled? Because mm -hmm. if I approach the coach, I'm not being a team player because football is a team sport, right? Versus those kids staying where they're at or going to programs that they can pick up and, and build up. You know, you know what I'm saying, Pep? Versus just front running. It, it's, it's easy to go to the school that's winning that you see, well, that school, oh, they're missing this or they're missing that. That's different from saying, you know what, I'm going to go because they're winning. Once you find winning – somewhere else build a program up and you know pep the players at the smaller schools or players at, at the schools that's not doing much winning they get highlighted too because at, matter of fact you're probably gonna get highlighted more i i give you an example pep yeah you will at the end of the day people will say well coach you coach at a 1a school all right but people know who my players are right could some of my players be second stringers of some of these bigger schools? Maybe, maybe not, right? But it don't matter. If you're not playing, you can't get recruited. Yeah. So so go somewhere, go somewhere you can get some film versus trying to front run because it's killing these kids recruiting as well. Mm -hmm. And I believe as well, too. Yeah, I believe as well, too, with the, uh, with the recruiting thing, too. People got to understand this, right? From my personal experience, like, I wanted – when I was in high school uh, – a few people probably know this, but I wanted to leave Shelby because and go to Burns because they was winning. You know what stopped that? My mom. My mom said, you're not going nowhere. You're staying in Shelby because we live in Shelby for one. And I like Shelby, so you're going to Shelby. So so think about <laughs> – so if a kid wants to transfer, like I go back, the parents have to be unhappy or be on board. And I think that's what people miss because – take for instance, right – if my kids play with Robert kids seven on seven, they don't play AAU basketball together, football, middle school football, all this stuff, right? But when they go to high school, eight of them go to Robert's school, eight of them go to my school, right? And say my school's losing, but Mount Island's winning. It ain't gonna take nothing for Jeremy to say, "Hey, hey, bro, come on, bro. We, you remember how we was and when we was middle school players? Like, let's come back up and team up." Right. So what people misunderstand, coaches job to recruit is easier now because the kids want to play with each other. And I think that's what people miss with the recruiting part, because hell, if I say I joined CFI and I had a great time, I have a great experience. Mm -hmm. I go back and tell Robert about it. Robert, like, hey, mom and dad, I'm trying to go join CFI, too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's one of those where like. I do think it's some crazy recruiting tactics that coaches may use in the past from schools that I've been at where they may follow kids home. I feel like that's very excessive. You following kids home and X, Y, Z 
talking to kids without parents around. I think that's what I think recruiting. I think that's I think that's next level. But, but I think but, as well, I think as well, like being in Charlotte, I believe what it is, kids want to go to programs that can provide them exposure and they can win also and they can play. Because like Coach Rock, because like Coach Dub said, I've no kids that transfer that don't get in. So every every transfer ain't a good transfer. I know transfer that's done came, try to stick it out, then left. You know what I'm saying? So it's like people recruit. Yeah, it's it's not it's natural to recruit. If I'm a winner, I want to keep winning. If I'm a loser, I'm trying to win. Well, well, so let, let, let me ask this question: Is it right for coaches to be recruiting? I think. I think it's depend on what no. you're doing. Honestly, I don't think it's right, but I think it's depend on. I think if the parents are calling the coaches, then that's different. Well, yeah, that's different. But and I'm Robert, not saying it, it, Robert that's parents, part coaches I know. recruiting. I mean, but, but, that's a part of recruiting, though. Recruiting. That's a part but, of recruiting, but, though. If the parents but, like, like, know how you shape it. Like, if I take one of Robert's players, but their parents are calling me, Rob's gonna say they recruited. That's recruiting. But if I'm calling his player, but but if I'm calling his running back, that's still. Recruit. It just depends on who makes the who making the phone calls. So well, if well, the see, coaches are making the calls, isn't right. No, coaches, I don't think coaches calling no, no, kids. No, no. Coaching calling no. kids is not right. No. no, 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 no. That's not right, and that's not our rules by the state. The state say you cannot have any undue influence. Trust that's me. That's what I, I was getting to. That's what I. I, I, I noticed. I'm telling. You, I ruined so many relationships. I could. Man, my my um my emails, my ad emails. We're, our emails are bogged down with kids wanting to be be at our school but we cannot talk to them we'll tell them like we cannot talk to you i literally got a copy paste thing like due to the nchsa rules i cannot talk to you and some of these parents be like dang coach rule because this coach over here at this school was talking to me and you won't talk to me i refuse to talk to him because all it's going to take is that kid to come over to your school not get playing time or not them not play you not play them the way the parents want you to play them and they're going to blow your spot up so you got to think about all the, the major players. Our first obligation is to our team as a whole, not one player, not one position. You got to make sure that if you're a coach, that you're moving in the best interest of your team as a whole. And I, I'd rather have a, a team of hard workers, kids that's homegrown that I've developed than some superstar kid trans, transferring in, tearing, tearing up the chemistry. Because I'm going to tell you, mm. most of the transfers, they don't work out. Because most of the kids is leaving, they're running from something. And you mm -hmm. you find out instantly that, okay, it wasn't a coach. It was a kid. So also with a lot, a lot of coaches, it's not actually the coaches that's employed by the school. In many cases, it's a lot of the hanger honors, the old youth coaches that can't let that player go because he was a star running back when he was five and six. I'm telling you, I went through a situation, and I won't say any names, but I went through a situation where I wouldn't let this guy on staff. And it's not that I wouldn't let him on staff. A, I didn't have the position to hire. I wasn't going to force him on the staff unless it was a need there. That was number one. But he ended up convincing a family member to leave our school to go to another school that he ended up transferring in before the season started to go to another school to sit on the bench. And this kid had the, the um, year before, he had ended up winning one of our MVP awards. But he goes to another school, a bigger school, and sit the bench. So me as a coach, because I'm a people's person and I'm in the kids' business, it hurt my heart to this day that this kid had to sit on the bench because he was listening to a clout chaser that was more worried about saying, hey, coach, if – and you, we hear it all the time. People won't admit it, but I'm going to tell you because I go through, through it where you get you coaches, hey, coach, if you let me on your staff – I can get you X, Y, Z players. Well, we got a lottery, so it ain't going to work here. But I know they go to other programs and, and partner with those coaching staff, and you start seeing – you know what I'm talking about, Pet, when y'all you and um, B covering games, and you go to the, the game, and it's about a million coaches on the sideline. <laughs> it's, it's, it's only five, five dudes that's actually coaching. You know who those dudes on the sideline doing that is? It's the ones that's bringing the talent to the school. So they give them a T-shirt and, and, and shorts or whatever, but it, I mean, it's 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 real out here. It's real out here. So, um, so that's that's it's not always the head coach or it's not always assistant coaches. 
it's people might that might be a part of the program or around the program mm -hmm. that's doing it. But I don't care if you're part of the program. If you're not a part of the program, it's wrong to recruit kids. You cannot do it. It's against state rules. All right. So let's go to some comments here because we got a, a lot on this topic, as we, we always do when we talk about it. Uh, Kim Watts, a uh, regular viewer, says, Dragonfly should track movement for kids moving to school. CMS should look into the 365 and residency rules. Coaches are finding loopholes and exploiting them. Oh, that, oh boy. <laughs> we could talk about that for a minute. Uh, let's see. Stephanie Reynolds says, some coach for clout and state players getting offers that don't exist. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see here. Kim Watts no, also said, oh, go ahead, coach. No, I'll go back to Stephanie's um, post real quick. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you something that's going on too, and this indirect recruiting is going on in this high school world. You got kids in schools having tweeting out fake offers to keep kids at the school or attract kids. It's it's a real it's a real thing that's going out right now. I'm telling wow. you, I see a. One well, we school. talked about this a couple yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, I, and I won't call out the school. That's not proper. But like I said, I seen some kids, and we played against them. And I'm like, Nah, call them out. They post a fake no, offer. Call them out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not you, it down. you already said you played against them. <laughs> right. That's crazy though. A fake offer is crazy. Yeah, offer. I, oh, I wouldn't gosh. even come to your I wouldn't even come to your school as a college coach if I know you're posting that. But but check this out. So the, no, no, uh, no, hold on now. I don't know what you're about to say, but hold on. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm saying the year before. <laughs> no, he ain't gonna say that, Pep. I, I, I promise you, Pep. All I'm gonna right. keep it clean. But right. but that leading up to that off off season, you had kids tweeting out, hey. We got Kentucky offers, right? And my kids are showing me like, oh, they got Kentucky offers. I said, okay, watch where they sign at. Come signing day, did they sign with Kentucky? They looked at, I didn't see them sign nowhere. So a lot of these coaches are recruiting indirectly by having their kids tweet out fake offers. Because, Pat, you know how many non-committable offers I can have my quarterback or have some of my players tweet out right now? That schools untold them. They got non-committable offers. I won't allow it. I will not allow it. It's not going to happen on my watch because it's setting everybody else up. And it's making the coaches look good, and it's not really the coaches doing anything. It's, it's fake. It doesn't exist. All right. So Kim Watts also says there's evidence. There's always evidence, but they, meaning coaches, don't turn it over because they don't want to hurt the kids. That's a good point. And I, uh, um, I can comment on that too, pal. With, yeah, uh, with there being evidence for people doing it as well, right? Um, also, well, I think what happens at times too, whenever one school may accuse another school of uh, taking players or kids, like recruiting kids, once those coaches have a conversation about like why that kid want to leave or why that kid parents say they want to leave, a lot of times those coaches go look themselves in the mirror and say, oh, okay, well, maybe I could have done something better while they was there or X, Y, Z. You know what I'm saying? Because like, like how Coach Dub said, if I know you personally and you trying to and, and I hear about that, I will call you and say, let's have a talk. Because me as a coach, if a kid from my island was trying to come to independent, I say, hey, Coach Dub, look, just, just because we know each other, I say, look, your boy yeah. trying to come and this is what they're saying y'all doing. Because mm. because even though he may allow them to go, me telling him that information about what they're saying can stop 20 more kids from leaving. Because it may be something that they can change that they don't know they're doing. Yeah. So yeah. So That's so now now there's no point of Coach Coach Dub saying, "Oh, here go the proof that they was taking them because those parents that came to me about something that they didn't like that me me or maybe that kid's position coach was were doing. So now that they know Coach Dub can get a hold on that position coach or maybe something that he was doing that he can change for the better. You know what I'm saying? So I think with the evidence, I mean, like people got evidence of a lot of things, but it's all about. Like me, I'm gonna keep going back to it about recruit. It's gonna be about why they leave or why they decide to stay. And I think like if I'm a coach and the kid wanna leave, okay, cool. I wish you the best. I will never be the coach to try to keep you because obviously it's something that you think you want or think you're ready for that you're chasing. So I'm gonna let you go do that. Right. But just know mm -hmm. like I had some people saying in the comments, some kids leave, try to come back. It's gonna be yeah. different for you when you come back. You know Jason what I'm saying? McNeely. It's gonna be different. Yeah. Says a lot of kids play at one school as a freshman transfer to another school 
and transfer back to the school they came from their senior year. <laughs> yeah, I've actually seen it's, that happen. I've seen that yeah. happen a lot of times too. It's where wild, I'm from, where we're from, but it's like it's so like away. it's crazy. Uh, crazy. let's see. Uh, Joe Hughes commenting to Coach Dub says, "What yoga retreat is Coach Dub?" <laughs> Hey, parts unknown. Parts unknown. <laughs> he back there on the golf course, it looked like. He definitely on the grid, man. off the grid. Man. <laughs> and then our buddy, Brandon Billups, says he's just here for the comments. All right. Well. And also, too, I think the term recruiting that came from high school kids, like what Karen Beck said, I think it started when private schools started taking kids. I think that's what – I think that's why people really don't make – like exposed public school transfers because I think everybody has kind of been upset with how private schools are able to work. So I think if anybody wants to expose people, I think people want to try to find a way to expose private schools with the things that they're allowed to do versus mm. versus uh, a public school. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes it's a depth thing too, though. Sometimes you got a quarterback that's good, but he's behind a great player and he's maybe yeah. the starter is younger than him or the same grade and Unless the other dude get hurt, he's not going to get on the field. So the coach say, hey, you sitting behind such and such. Why don't you just come over here? I need a quarterback, and you riding the bench behind such and such. Why don't you just come over here? And sometimes it's just that easy. Sometimes the program ain't yeah. doing anything negative. It's just a depth thing. They just yeah. they just kind of steal from the rich, basically. Y'all so deep over there. I, I got a slot. Just come on instead of riding the bench. It's easy to get a kid in that scenario. Also, too, to your point, B, Again, it's gonna it's gonna come back to dating with recruiting. Sometimes telling you, sometimes telling your homeboys about them girls you like or you talk to could be a bad thing. You tell them too much. Hey, you tell them too hey, much. Hey, so, now, guy, so now, is there so something why, you need to get off your chest? No, I'm guy. just saying. Hey. You know what I'm, saying? <laughs> I'm saying, like I've know with situations from where I'm from, where a man has talked about his woman to another guy so much, good or bad. Then, ex- then a couple months later, you like, goodness gracious. But I'm telling you, like, that happens more times like, with recruiting. If Coach Dub is keep telling me about this freshman, oh, say for instance, Coach Dub got the freshman track guy that I don't heard about. Imagine if he just went around talking about how bad he was, and then a coach just say, but look, well, this is what your head coach said about you. Then he leave. Or, or maybe Rob has five freshmen, good guys that's good in the 100 or four by one, but only four of them can run. I'm gonna say okay. I might try to go get the fourth one because obviously you can come be the man here. Like that's what I'm saying. Like recruiting is so many things that current coaches are doing that they don't even realize about how they talk about. Maybe they like some coaches be like, like we deep. Boy, I got five linebackers. We deep. Okay, I'm gonna go get number five then since he ain't playing. <laughs> that's you know that's what I'm exactly. Saying? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm right. saying. So, so that's what I'm saying. People be saying, people be trying to blame the school they going uh, to. People try to blame the school they going to without even thinking about Rob. You don't told me how good the freshman was. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a chance now versus you saying he'll be good by <laughs> he'll be able to start for me by his junior year. Well, that coach gonna go try to go get him started sophomore year. So I'm yeah. saying recruiting has so many variations, and I'm telling you, recruiting is just like it's all like. It's like dating, man. It's so crazy. Uh, We're we gonna end the segment now. We have made too many references I, to dating. I, 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 so it's just real. Though. He's watching the it's show. Real. Adam Adam is single, so I think he's that's what he's trying hey, to do. Hey, no, I'm here. saying it's yeah, I'm telling you, you have to be careful who you talking about your players to. You just got to be careful because Coach Rob know he know what I'm he know what I'm talking about. People do it all the time. Talking about man, I got man, we got shoot, we got eight receivers that can play Friday night. All right, yep. well, I'm gonna go take number seven. I'm gonna take number seven and bring him over here with us, then. Since you got so many, hey, 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 it works. Because, because let me last let me word, you. Coach Dub. Last word. Let, let me tell you something. All I gotta say: don't save them. They don't want to be saved. Don't, don't save, save them. them. <laughs> don't save them. You don't you save them. You want to keep telling me? Hey, 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 Rob. Let they keep go. telling us about them. They number seven, number eight. Well, next year you're gonna be playing against them. <laughs> you keep talking about them. I'll Comment you, in the end of the segment right here from uh, Brandon Phillips. Is this somebody nah, took tell, tell B, guys, hey, hey, B, <laughs> hey, B, one thing about me, B, that's not, hey, I'm undefeated in that category. I ain't never had that. <laughs> Gotta love the never project. That we done went way right over the time. So <laughs> we come back here on Football Focus Weekly, <laughs> BRB Media. I will quickly give my top five class of 2025 linebackers. And give the guys a break. So we'll be right back. Good. 
Uh, all right. So now I'm going to very quickly do my top five class of 2025 linebacker rankings. And I'm going to try to get through this as fast as we can because we got one last segment to do on the show that I really want to get in. Uh, all right. So number five, we got Adrian Scott from Corvian. Uh, six foot five, 200 pounds. Uh, he really jumped on the radar last season uh, with some good production in a short amount of time. Uh, five games, produced 48 total tackles and eight sacks. Uh, looks really good on film coming off the edge. He's in very good speed, athletic ability to shed blocks. Um, he also runs down uh, plays in space when the go, uh, play goes away from him. I'm excited to see how he's going to develop this upcoming season. He's been offered by Coastal Carolina. Buffalo and Kentucky, and I think once he gets into more camps in the spring and uh, summer, more offers are going to come his way. Uh, number four in the class of 2025 linebacker rankings is for the Charlotte Metro area is uh, Eddie Conover from Huff. Uh, he had a really strong year last year, uh, had over 100 total tackles, 30 tackles for loss, and 17 sacks. That's some incredible uh, production. Six foot two, 220 pounds. He's got an offer from Charlotte. And recruiting interest from other colleges as well. Um, oh, excellent overall athlete. His first highlight on his uh, film, he's a 65 yard touchdown run as a running back. Um, and then you keep looking at the film, more plays coming off the edge, making multiple tackles and sacks in the backfield. He has a great first step, shows good strength, um, really good get off on that first step. Um, and I think more offers are going to come his way as camp season gets deeper and deeper. Uh, number three is Kendrick Davis from Palisades. Uh, he currently has offers from Charlotte, Alabama A&M, East Carolina, Liberty, Appalachian State, Marshall, and James Madison. Uh, one of the more highly recruited linebackers in the state of North Carolina. Uh, two-time all-conference player, six foot two, 200 pounds. Uh, really good overall athletic ability and a 3.25 GPA. Um, really makes physical tackles. Really, really great solo tackler. Force fumbles on multiple occasions on his highlight film. Uh, shows a good ability to blitz from depth. Um, and then he, he can make plays in the passing game. Reads quarterback size, forcing pass knockdowns and uh, breakups in uh, pass coverage. All right, number two is Jackson Forrest from Northwest Cabarrus. The production on this young man is incredible. Uh, first of all, he's six foot one, 220 pounds. He was his conference's defensive player of the year. Um, 147 total tackles, 84 solo tackles, 40 tackles for loss, and 18 sacks. That, that's just crazy. He's got offers from Charlotte, Appalachian State, Cornell, Princeton, Old Dominion, Lafayette, and Columbia. Um, his film was really impressive. In the first clip, he reads the middle screen, picks it off, and takes it back 80 yards for a touchdown. Um, he just obliterates and shedding blocks against powerful offensive linemen, mainly guards and centers that are trying to come off second level. Um, he should be getting more offers. I mean, he's, he's that good. And then number one is Jamari Farmer from Mooresville. Um, I saw him up close at a showcase. Uh, could instantly see he was a D1 prospect. At the time, he didn't have any offers. Immediately after that showcase, he picked up his first offer from Cincinnati. And then he's added Coastal Carolina, Old Dominion, and Georgia Southern. Six foot one, 210 pounds, a productive season last year, 130 total tackles, 98 solo tackles, which is really impressive. 26 tackle for, tackles for loss and eight sacks, and he was his conference's player of the year and broke three school records in the process. Um, his highlight film, like some of the other guys I mentioned, his first clip really jumped off the page. He took a zone drop, read the wheel concept from a running back, uh, excuse me, a slot receiver, and then picked it off and ran it back 98 yards for a touchdown. That's just not normal stuff. <laughs> Big time player. That's why he's number one in these rankings. Other kids to watch Braden Barger from Weddington. I think he's a tough, old school, hard nosed linebacker. Really enjoyed watching his film. Camden Martin from Independence. His strength really stood out. Uh, he can play defensive line also. I think he'll have a big senior year. Uh, Julian Platt from Rocky River. He's a very good three-down linebacker who's smart and um, has a really great personality. I think he's going to be a strong leader. Uh, Mark Foster from West Mecklenburg, great athlete. He's a tackling machine all over the field. Led that uh, very good Queen City Conference in total tackles last year. And then Nick Norris from Shelby, 
Um, I think he should be getting more attention. He had 133 total tackles last season, and I think just period, he needs more recruiting attention. Whew. All right, those are the top five uh, 2025 linebackers in the Charlotte metro area. All right. Now, when we come back on WDRB Media, we're going to finish up the show talking about Garinger High School. Their head coaching position is open once again. We're going to ask the guys about that and some of the things that have happened with Garinger over the years here on WDRB Media, the voice of the community with CFI Football Focus Weekly. All right, we're back. We're going to bring the group, uh, we're going to bring the guys back, and we're going to talk about Garinger High School. We just learned, um, actually it's been open since March 18th, but just learned that their head coaching position is open once again. Um, if you've been around the Charlotte area, you know that this position has been open repeatedly over the years. And, um, you know, it's been a lot of different reasons, you know, why. Uh, but, guys, with Garinger High School being open once again, what's it going to take? For to get for them to get the right person in here and then try to get this thing going on the right track. Um, I would say from being in the past, outside looking in, being at Shelby, then then being now at Independence, being able to coach against Garinger. Um, I think for one, it's like you said, like trying to find the right person. I think a lot of people apply for jobs thinking they can just change something in a year. Uh, I think whoever wants to coach at Garinger, be the head coach at Garinger. They have to under, first you need to understand what you're getting yourself into and like what can you do to change it. And I don't think that's a one year thing. I think that'd be a multiple year thing. I think the biggest thing is not necessarily the coaches. I think it's more so at times how the state maybe has failed Garinger in ways of giving them another opportunity to play. Like it should be no reason why um they're playing for a ball. I understand that in Charlotte and school size may matter, but they're coming to football games with maybe 20 or 30 kids. This is no reason why they couldn't maybe play 1A or 2A, right? Like, find ways to help them. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, you're not doing nothing to help them. I think now even you have kids, right? Say you got a kid that wants to play football for Garinger, but every year he has a different coach. Like, you making him or making those cheerleaders or making those fans not want to love the game or love Garinger football because – Every year is something different. Like so, at the coach. I think what the biggest thing the coaches have to understand that's coming in and out that the kids there. That's all they've seen was people come and leave. So how can they really develop relationships with you as a coach if all you want to do is come and leave, come and leave, come and leave? You're providing to the stigma that's surrounded around the school because people come and people leave. And then I get it gets to the point where um, I think that. I think now at this point, the way the climate's changing with like how, how we spoke about kids transferring, kids leaving, things like that. I personally think if if they're not going to do anything to help Garinger, they need to let those kids go play at the nearest school in their school district and still let them go to Garinger, but let them play somewhere else. Because at this point, I don't think this is a one, one or two year fix. I think Garinger has gotten a bad rep from things in the past that don't even the kids that go there now don't even know about. I think that's so, what happens with a lot of schools. I think that what happens with a lot of schools because people think when they hear Charlotte, when they hear you think like when they hear you go to school in Charlotte, they automatically think it's something bad attached to it. And I think the kids at Garinger now, like while kids don't come or while parents not letting them come, it's stuff that happened in the past. So it's like I think you had to do a whole 360 to change the yep. school dynamic in the football team. They, they need a coach that views it as a, a long term project. Like you're not yeah. gonna come in there and turn it around. In a year, there are some schools out there sometimes that just a certain coach away and the team just on the cusp. That's not one of them. I guess an analogy I could use is like restoring an old hot rod. It's going to take a long time, but it's worth it in the end. But, you know, that old rusty car to get it back right, it takes a long time, but it can be done with the right work and the right patience. You can restore it. And they got a, you know, a coach this, this sees it as a, you know, a three or four year turnaround. And, um, Whoever's there, they got to get in the school. So I guarantee you, I know grades are a thing, but I guarantee you some kids in that school with some athletic ability, they're just like, oh, I don't want to go up. Why do I want to go out there and lose every week? But you got to convince those kids, hey, if you, 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 if all of y'all come out, we won't be that anymore. They, they got to big. I'm, I'm certain there's some athletes in the school that could play that just shy away from it because of the stigma. So 
get into school and have some patience, man. They got to get in them hallways. And also, I mean, we literally two weeks ago just ran at Garinger. It's talent over there. They got an excellent track program. Um, Tanya Fillmore, she's doing – if anybody in the track world, they know Tanya Fillmore, <laughs> phenomenal coach. But they got the athletes over there. I've I mm-hmm. seen kids running a 4x8, 4x4, 4x2, 4x1. You got to have athletes to be able to compete um, and, and be able to fill those events. So I've seen the athletes on the field. What I think personally, I think a hard reset needs to happen as far as um, maybe going back to maybe playing a couple years, two years of JV, start building those classes up, like start with your ninth, 10th graders, do two years of JV, and then uh, move up to varsity. I just think that continue to fill the varsity team and those kids continue to get beat, beat, beat. Because that's demoralizing for coaches, for players, and it's hard to get kids to come out and when you already know that you might lose. So I think maybe um, starting at a JV level and starting fresh with um, some younger kids in ninth and 10th grade and just have, building success within there. Because if you think about it, you play two years of JV at Garinger. Maybe you win seven, eight games. You know, may, maybe you That'd win. Be great. You, yeah, you, yeah, you finish over 500 on a JV level because it can be done. How much momentum those kids are going to have that was ninth and 10th graders on that team when you start a varsity program, now they're 11th and 12th grade. Now they know what winning looks like. So to, the, to that point, we know that Garinger did play JV for one year uh, because, heck, we were there. We covered it. Um, they, they beat Providence when uh, Coach Billups was there. And the thing about it is – We've seen that done with um, other schools. I think about the school in Union County uh, that stepped back and played JV uh, for a couple years. Uh, so there's, there's precedent there. But the problem with it, and they moved Garinger back up to varsity after that one year because the schools that they play against, it was hard for them to find games within their schedule to replace them on the varsity side of things. So I think it's going to have to take a lot more – um, kind of buy-in and then cohesion across the board if that's something that's going to be done um, yeah. going forward, period. Yeah. Um, I think, too, uh, also, ahead, like, 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 like for Coach Dub's comment about the track program, I think the only program that's suffering is football because their soccer team is, is one of the best in the area. Um, their soccer team always have – I think their soccer team may have more players on it than the football team. Like how you say track got this. I think they have to find a way – with football, like, and I see Coach Billups' comment about, um, about like what school, like what middle schools are feeding into Garinger. And that's a big part about building a program where, like, you got to be able to have good middle school feeders to come into your program. Now you can say, okay, okay, if we do start JV, we can have the numbers to compete and play. And then we can keep building and building and building. So at the same time, it's like, I think Garrett, a lot of kids that may be zoned to go to Garinger for high school, they just go somewhere else. So it's like you have to be able to start. I think that's a high school and middle school thing. Like what feeders – like they have to get the feeder programs on board with the high school. And then those high school teams have to just keep building, building up again. But I think they have to do something to help them because obviously it's kids there that want to be there because if they didn't want to be there, they all their sports would be struggling. Adam, the they're, pro- winning the, it. they're winning the other sports too. The, pro- the problem with that theory of having them go to another school, the NCHSA bylaws won't allow it. They literally just allow homeschool kids to be able to go to um, teams in their area. So it would be, have to be something that NCHSA would have to come in and be able to allow it. Because I'm pretty sure CMS uh, would definitely want to put those kids in the best situation as possible. Yeah. All right. Well, that being said, uh, I think we're going to keep this topic on the docket for next week because we ran short on time. I think there's a lot of layers that we need to uncover with it. So we'll check back on this topic again wet next week, along with a lot of other things that we need to discuss. But on behalf of Coach Doug Robert Washington of Mountain Island Charter, Adam Big Eye Shelby Weber of Independence High School, uh, the producer Brandon Black, former Harding Ram defensive end, who we might go up against in one-on-ones here pretty soon. Uh, that's a reference on Twitter. I'm the pet man, Matt that's Mar. Right. Thank you for listening to Football Focus Weekly here on WDRB Media. Make sure you keep it locked into the best high school football show in the Carolinas and beyond. Have a good week.